1960, steam train production was finally halted, with the BR-9F class set up as the last to roll off the production lines. BR Western Region Staff Magazine held a competition to name this engine. Three different readers won the competition, suggesting the name Evening Star. It was the only 9F class to receive a unique name. The question now was what to do with the over 20,000 steam trains in service on British Railways. It was all perfectly good stock and could have kept running for several decades if they so wished, but to do so would require BR to maintain all the labour intensive infrastructure surrounding the steam engines along with that of the diesels. To do so would be expensive, particularly if the steam engines wound down gradually. By the end of the run, coal supplies and water towers would have to be kept in place all across the country to service a very limited number of engines. And so it was decided that steam trains would have to be withdrawn in one fell swoop. Diesels were overcoming their initial teething problems. As soon as they were available in sufficient numbers in each region, the steam trains would be retired. Over the next few years, each region in turn made the switch. The very last holdout of steam was the Northwest region. On the 11th of August 1968, the last timetabled steam service in mainline Britain ran from Liverpool to Carlisle and back, nicknamed the 15 Guinea Special due to the high price travellers had to pay to be part of history, and tickets sold out quickly, with hundreds paying for the opportunity to be part of the final chapter of 160 years of steam locomotion on the railways. The next day saw a two year ban on steam running on the main lines, just to make it clear that it would not be back. Tens of thousands of steam engines were unceremoniously shuttled off to the scrap heap. Some were relics, around 90 years old and long overdue for retirement, but others were brand new and intended to keep running into the 90s. It was a tragic end for them. Not every engine suffered this fate. BR produced a short list of engines considered historically significant for preservation. Others were bought by private collectors. At Woodham Scrapyard on Barry Island, Owner Di Woodham acquired 297 engines in the scrappage, but he worked out that it would be more profitable to focus on scrapping the wagons they had also acquired. He ordered his team to work on them, while offering the engines for sale. This gave steam preservation societies time to get the necessary funds together. Between 1968 and 1990, 213 engines were saved from this yard, estimated to make up 80% of the preserved steam engines in the country. Diesels, as it turned out, did not fare much better than their steam counterparts. The modernisation plan had produced more classes of diesels than anyone knew what to do with, many of which suffered from fundamental flaws. BR had determined five main classes and had identified the best example in each. Mass production of the others was stopped and the remainders were sent to the scrap heap as soon as they could be replaced. Ironically, many classes of diesels were scrapped before the steam counterparts they had been intended to replace, and few were interested in preserving them. BR had now finally streamlined their engines into a small number of diesel power classes, but it had come at great expense. A whole generation of steam engines had been rapidly developed, followed by a whole generation of diesels, each of which had been sent straight to the scrap heap. This had torn a serious hole in BR's funding. Meanwhile, passenger and freight traffic was flagging. By 1961, BR were losing £300,000 a day. To make matters worse, the government's transport policies were becoming increasingly road-centric. In 1959, a new Minister for Transport was appointed known as Ernest Marples. Marples was a keen advocate for the roads, seeing the car as a symbol of personal freedom. He also owned majority shares in a major tarmacking company and stood to make a lot of money from major road building projects. Recognising the conflict of interest this presented, he agreed to sell all his shares upon coming to power, but not before he'd awarded his company several major contracts, and according to many accounts, he sold most of his shares to his wife. Marples and his predecessors in the Macmillan government instigated several schemes to boost the power of the roads. In 1959, the M1 opened, Britain's first motorway in what would soon become an extensive network. Now, long-distance road traffic could compete with the railways in terms of speed. 
1959 also saw the introduction of the Routemaster bus, a double-decker design capable of taking on the task of road transport on a scale previous motorbuses could only have dreamed of. Each Routemaster could carry enough passengers to replace trams and trolley buses on a one-for-one -one basis. Marples sought to make Britain's cities more car-friendly, largely by widening the streets, and there was no room for trams in this vision. Widening the streets also meant tearing down trolley bus cables, so now they needed to go too. Of course, these systems had been in rapid decline for a while, but Marples delivered the killing blow. Many cities, which had previously aimed to keep their networks going, now had no choice but to close them down, since there was no support coming from the government. From 1962, Blackpool was the only British city running year-round tram services, and the last permanent trolley bus shut in 1972. But this was far from the most controversial move made by this government. In 1963, Marples appointed Dr Richard Beachy as head of BR, a chemist with no previous experience working on railways. But he had a strong analytical mind, which Marples felt was what was needed to revive BR's fortunes. Just like him, Beeching felt the railways should be run as a profit-making exercise rather than a public service. Some of Beeching's ideas were successful and almost universally welcomed, in particular his reforming of rail freight. In 1962, the government finally repealed the common carrier's policy, which had required railways to carry absolutely anything they were asked on a first-come, first-served basis. This was a major burden on time and resources. Often, entire locomotives would have to be dedicated to carrying a single wagon. Even larger services would be run more like passenger trains, continuously stopping en route to drop off and add on wagons, a very slow, complicated and expensive process. With the common carrier's policy repealed, Freight operators could be more selective, with the focus being on long distance bulk cargo. Entire train loans would be carried directly from location to location without having to make pickups and drop offs along the way. In particular, focusing on industries which required a continuous supply of raw materials or a continuous supply of their product to the docks for export. Small fiddly loads would only be taken where it was convenient otherwise they would be turned away and told to take it by road instead, which saved money for all concerned. This new model moved away from the traditional wagons and towards the shipping container. The entire container could be filled at the start of the journey and at each stage it could be sorted, stacked and transferred with ease. Beeching correctly calculated the minimum distance that different quantities of freight would need to be moved to be profitable. Traditional wagons would need to go almost to the other end of the country before they would be worth their while to transport. By 1970, the number of freight services in Britain was at 29% of what it had been 10 years earlier, but the volume of goods carried was 86%. This approach to rail freight was pioneering and copied across the world. The higher-ups at BR would later be instrumental in creating an international agreement for the standard dimensions of shipping containers, greatly streamlining trade worldwide. But Beeching's success with freight is massively overshadowed by his highly divisive policy when it came to passenger services. His plan was to close down any lines which were operating at a financial loss, believing it would leave behind a profit-making core. In April 1961, he organised a covert survey. Workers with clipboards spent a week monitoring how many were travelling on every line, and the results were startling. 95% of passengers were travelling on just 50% of services. Many have criticised the validity of this survey. Those who worked on the lines that will be shut claim to have spotted the surveyors standing around with clipboards, but only in dead hours, never at rush hour. From this, it was easy for people to spin conspiracy theories. While it is unlikely that the survey was deliberately rigged, it provided a limited amount of data, surveying a single week during the school holidays. Beeching refused any suggestion that the survey should be repeated to gain information about a full spectrum of circumstances, or just to ensure that they hadn't surveyed the lines on a bad week. And surveying passengers alone didn't account for other factors 
such as the importance of the line to local infrastructure. With these flawed results, Beeching published his report, entitled The Reshaping of British Railways. The full publication was mass-produced and distributed throughout the country, with full statistics and pull-out maps for the public to review. It recommended closing a third of Britain's lines, taking 2,363 stations with them. Beeching argued that those who'd lost their local stations could take the bus instead. Most of the country was already covered by buses. Where it wasn't, replacement services would be set up. The public was used to line closures by this point, but now it was out in the open that line closures would be happening at a greatly accelerated rate. And so there was a public outcry. Line closures were a major issue at the 1964 general election, with Labour leader Harold Wilson promising to fight to protect the condemned lines. Wilson won the election and moved into number 10. Straight away, he announced that he'd change his mind and would be following Beeching's recommendations after all. Clearly, campaigns to save lines would have to be done at a local level. In many cases, these campaigns were successful and lines were saved from closure, most often happening in marginal constituencies. However, it seems this may have moved the problem elsewhere, as many lines were shut which hadn't originally been singled out in the Beeching report. Whilst it may be tempting to imagine Beeching as a sort of cartoon villain cruelly slashing away at a beloved network, the story is far more complicated. While his survey may have been flawed, there were genuinely whole swathes of the network which are being built to cater for a demographic which no longer existed. In the 19th century, many lines were primarily aimed at servicing goods trade to local businesses, businesses that had since shut down or moved all their goods to road instead. Since they were primarily goods lines, passengers had always been limited, and maintaining a full service for a small number of passengers was simply not sustainable. At the extreme end, the Thetford to Swaffham line ran five trains every day, but the survey had recorded just nine passengers. Hindsight being 2020, it can be seen that the coming decades would see a railway revival, and the lines that were being shut would be badly needed. But to most at the time, it seemed as though the trend could only go one way. Just as the railways had supplanted the canals and the stagecoaches, now they too were being supplanted by the roads. Many were even drawing up plans for an eventuality where the railways died out altogether. In these circumstances, the Beeching Report would have seemed like a reasonable compromise to allow the railways to continue on in this new world, but in a limited capacity. Howard Wilson once criticised Beeching for being too pro-rail and too anti-road. And while Beeching cuts is often used as an umbrella term for closed lines, he was far from the only instigator. Arguably, he was more of a middleman, since his report was only a recommendation after all. Line closures had been happening long before he came on the scene, they continued after he was gone, and they happened independently in Ireland and all across the world. Beeching insisted that while he was seen as the axe man chopping away at the network, he saw himself more as the surgeon, carefully cutting away rotten material to preserve what he could, making hard and necessary decisions. But while few would argue that the network could have been preserved in its full glory, it is still fair to dispute whether the closures had to be as extreme as they were. Alternatives were proposed in which the running costs could be reduced but the line kept open. The East Suffolk line showed just how a line could be reformed. Initially marked for closure, many jobs were automated, such as the signals and the crossing gates to reduce staff. Meanwhile, the stations became unstaffed, barring those at each end of the line. Instead, tickets were bought on the train, and the ongoing dieselisation efforts were reducing running costs nationwide. The line was able to turn over a profit, and so was spared the axe but suggestions that similar schemes could be applied elsewhere were shot down by those in charge. These schemes would require investment, and few were interested in investing in what they saw as a dying industry. The failure of the modernisation plans confirmed their views as far as they were concerned. This was likely short-sighted, since in many of the lines marked for closure, the loss margin was quite small, and a quick investment could have revitalised them. 
Beeching insisted on going all in with this scheme, even rejecting such compromises as simply preserving the track bed along with the bridges and tunnels at a minimal cost, just in case an occasion came for the line to be reopened later, a strategy successfully employed in much of the continent. Instead, the bridges were broken up for scrap and no uniform policy was put in place for the beds. Some were left as they were, albeit overgrown, some became walking and cycling routes, some roads, and others built over in housing and retail developments. All this served to create a greater challenge for future generations who did indeed wish to reopen many of the lines. Beeching's belief that closing the least profitable lines would create a network that would turn over a steady profit were proved badly wrong. Savings made in running costs were accompanied by a severe drop in passenger numbers. The reduction of the network shattered much of the public confidence in trains, not to mention removing a number of crosslinks made many people's journeys much longer and less attractive. It also cost the network much of its inflow traffic. Beeching had assumed that a passenger who had lost their local station would drive to the nearest railhead and take the train from there. In reality, once a traveller is on the road, they normally prefer to go straight to their destination that way. Critics of Beeching, even at the time, pointed out that if the roads were surveyed in the same way the rails were, it would produce similar results, with the bulk of traffic happening on a relatively small number of roads, but if the least used roads were ripped up, it would render the network useless. Continuously cutting off the least useful routes is a good way to kill the tree. The overall financial savings for British Rail are hard to quantify but the general estimation is that their annual net loss was reduced by around 30 million over the period of the closures. But this was a drop in the bucket when their annual loss before had been around 100 million. Furthermore, Beeching's arguments focused too much on the railways as a profit-making exercise and not as a public service. Even if a line only caters to nine people, it can be vitally important to those nine as well as the surrounding community. While some transport needs could be filled by buses, many could not, particularly in rural communities. The town of Hwick on the Scottish borders, for instance, upon losing their line, found themselves in the unenviable position of being the British town furthest from the nearest train station. By train, they could get to Edinburgh in around an hour. By bus, it took three times as long. While this is an extreme case, similar stories were happening across the country. Many of the replacement bus services the government had set up had to shut within a few years since too few people were willing to travel on them every day. This left whole regions with very little public transport and areas that had once been thriving became sleepy backwaters. On the north coast of Devon and Cornwall, the railways have fared poorly in Beeching Survey as it was not done in the busy season. In the summer, the trains would bring a wealth of tourist traffic. When the lines were shut down, the roads proved insufficient for the task. As a result, the local economy slumped. In 1968, the new Minister for Transport, Barbara Castle, passed the Transport Act, setting stricter conditions under which a line could be shut, requiring several stages of public consultations and parliamentary acts. As a result, the rate of line closures slowed significantly. Since the network's peak in 1928, more than 14,000 kilometres of track had been closed. Though the closures had been curtailed, the issue of shrinking importance of the railways was still in place. Work was needed to inspire confidence once more and draw the crowds back. But that is a subject for next time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And why not leave a comment to help the channel grow? I am currently working on part 16 of this series, which should be with you in the next couple of months. In the meantime, why not check out the rest of the series? Or have a look at my website on my Etsy page for more examples of my artwork. See you soon!